withholding nothing, withholding nothing, withholding Church. My name is Kent Suits. I'm the pastor here at Christ Community Church. It's good to have you with us this morning for worship. A couple of housekeeping things. First is if you are there it is. If you are new to worship with us, we have these welcome cards on the inside part of the aisle. If you would not mind, please fill one of those out for us so we know who you are. We like to send a greeting card to you, thanking you for worshiping with us this morning. Uh, a couple of other things. Restrooms, if you are new, the restrooms are straight down the hallways back here in the back building by the water fountain. You can go through the doors if you would like, or you can go outside the back doors there and around the side to the side entrance to get to those. Also, we are beginning to offer child care for kids five and under. Uh, we stopped that when COVID hit, and it's been out of uh, practice for a while now, but we now have a rotation of volunteers available for child care for any kids five and under so that parents with young kids are able to pay attention and listen during the sermon while not having to pacify or be distracted by their kids. Um, and we want to offer a time for them to be able to play and move and have energy and also have a short lesson as well. So. Uh, if you know anyone with young kids, families that are looking for a church where they can sit under the preaching of the word, but also have their kids who are young and a little bit you know, energetic uh, to be able to sit during the sermon during that time, we do now offer that. Um, however, if we don't have kids that fit that category on a given Sunday, those workers can continue to sit in worship with us. Couple other announcements. These all have to do with Easter week, also known as Holy Week. The first thing is another opportunity for us to serve our community here, which is a big part of our mission statement, which I just realized I forgot to say. We exist to help people know Jesus Christ and serve the community by being the church. You don't have to go back to that, don't worry about it. Um, so Easter week. We do need help for this night. This is Wednesday night. The town of Bates Releaseville always, well, all, not always because of COVID, but now they are again offering a Easter egg hunt on Wednesday night before Easter. That's on April 13th. And we need people to help with that. We're going to have a table out there. We'll probably have a few activities at the table. We'll have some things to hand out. And just to be able to greet people from the town and uh, people are looking or interested in a church or in our church to just be able to have some people there representing to say hey to our neighbors, to greet them, to offer some things for kids to do. And so please do come if you are able to that night. I'll have more info about how you can serve specifically. And if you have kids that would like to be a part of the Easter egg hunt, they are doing that for children eight and under. A couple other opportunities. Um, as you know, Holy Week has many services leading up to Easter Sunday. And so another one that we're going to be doing, we actually have two partnering services that we're going to do with some of our sister churches. The first is on Monday, Thursday. We're going to partner with Lexington Presbyterian Church, which is one of our sister churches in Lexington, for their Monday, Thursday service. That's on that Thursday, April 14th. I believe that starts at 6 p.m. Um, Shanez is going to be partnering with their music team to do worship, and uh, we will also be able to participate in their uh, communion, and I, they have asked me to speak that evening, so if you would like to come to that service. And then this is exciting. Good Friday, we're again partnering. We did this a few years back before COVID. We're going to partner with all of the Lexington County PCA churches, so I believe there's seven of us total who are involved in this service. And we're going to be at the Lexington Town Amphitheater. Uh, it's going to be an outdoor service. Last time we had great weather. We're praying for good weather again. Uh, there is a rain contingency plan. But that, again, is going to be a very nice, reflective service on the crucifixion of Jesus, preparing us for his resurrection on Easter Sunday. And then Easter Sunday, we're going to plan on doing our breakfast and service again so we will be looking for people to bring food and invite friends and i would i would just 
encourage you now to be praying and thinking about who's one person, one person that you could invite for Easter Sunday this year. Because as we all know, that is a time when people who have not been in church or have not been at a church for a while are considering where they might worship. So if you have friends, family, neighbors, anyone that you can think of and be praying about inviting them for that service, please be doing that as well. That's all I have now for announcements, so I would ask Jack to come back up and lead us in our time of confession. Thank you. Here, let's call a confession from Psalm 31, verses 19 through 24. Oh, how abundant is your goodness! which you have stored up for those who fear you and work for those who take refuge in you. In the sight of the children of mankind, in the cover of your presence you hide them from the plots of men. You store them in your shelter from the strife of tongues. Blessed be the Lord, for he has wonderfully shown his steadfast love to me. When I was in a besieged city, I had said in my alarm, I am cut off from your sight. But you heard the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cried to you for help. Love the Lord, all you his saints. The Lord preserves the faithful, but abundantly repays the one who acts in pride. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who wait for the Lord. Would you take a moment for personal repentance and prayer, either individually or with those around you? Father, you are full of mercy and compassion. You know our hearts, and you have heard our petitions. We have all sinned and fall short of your glory. And we thank you for giving us a path of redemption through faith in your Son, Jesus. And Lord Jesus, we need your Spirit to help us walk with you in daily repentance, for us to love one another and to make disciples in all the nations. All this in the powerful name of Jesus we ask. Amen. Now let us confess our faith. <laughs> Question 12. According to God's righteous judgment, we deserve punishment both now and in eternity. How then can we escape this punishment and return to God's favor? God requires that his justice be satisfied. Therefore, the claims of his justice must be made what kind of mediator and deliverer should we look for then? One who is truly human, truly righteous, and yet more powerful than all creatures, that is, for one who is all the truth of God. Why must the mediator be truly human and truly righteous? God's justice demands that human nature, which is sin, was a favor of sin. Why must the mediator also be true God? So that by the power of the divinity, the mediator might bear what he might anger and judgment with, and earn for us and restore to us righteousness and life. And who is this mediator? True God, and at the same time, truly human and truly righteous. Our Lord Jesus Christ, who is given to us, says,
Yeah. 
Amen. We come to a time now during our service where we have the kingdom prayer. If you would, please, by your hands and close your eyes with me. Father God, ruler of all the world, we thank you for your grace and mercy that you have given to us on this beautiful day and throughout our entire lives. We ask that you are continuing to give us grace and mercy, although we do not deserve it. I ask that you are covering this church, that you're covering this congregation, those who are watching, those who are here, those who are out in the world. We ask that we're able to see a small glimpse of your love, that we're able to give all undivided praises unto you. We ask that uh, through this church, that through this fellowship and family, that we're able to have humility and godly wisdom, that we're able to love others, that we're able to tell them about the good news that you've given, that we're able to bring them into a church and a family, knowing that we are sinners ourselves, that we are not uh, righteous in ourselves, that we are not justified in ourselves, but it's nothing but God and Jesus and for him dying on the cross that has given us this life that we're able to live with him. God, I ask that you help us, that even when we feel unconfident, that we're able to still have love for others. Even when we feel hatred and anger and sadness and grief, that we're still able to love, that we're able to exude this wonderful love and a small glimpse of love that you have given to us, that we're able to have a small glimpse of that within ourselves to show to others. And Father God, I thank you for this church family for allowing us to have accountability, to have a, um, a family, a time to fellowship. And I ask that you are allowing us to still learn, that we're able to grow, and that we're able to continue to praise your name. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> According to Mark chapter 9. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. There appeared to them Elijah and with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, and they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone but them, with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen, until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, what did the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them, and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed, and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And he answered them, O oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear, you, bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit was saw him, immediately he convulsed the boy. And he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, 
how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to them, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after carrying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out. And the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, What could we do? Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, This kind cannot be driven out with anything but prayer. They went on from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. But they did not understand the saying, and were afraid to ask him. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? <clears throat> but they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve. And he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, Whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Whoever causes one of the little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in your lives and be at peace with one another. Chapter 10. And he left there and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan, and crowds gathered to him again. And again, as was his custom, he taught them. And Pharisees came up and, and in order to test him, asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, 
let not man separate. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to them, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time. Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. And they were on the road, going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him, and after three days he will rise. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called to them, and Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. 
And they came to Jericho. And he and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. I've got my microphone on now. Well, good morning again. Good morning. My name is Kent Suits. I'm the pastor here. Um, I feel like I may have misled you a couple weeks ago when I said that Jack and Susan had read the longest passage of our series. Um, and I feel bad that y'all got the longest one again. I almost feel like we should give them an applause, like they did a good job. <laughs> um, thank y'all for, for taking our, our big chunks out. That one gave uh, the last one a run for its money. Um, but if you would, please do have your Bible open to these two chapters. I'm going to be trying to move through them fairly quickly. Uh, but our theme this morning is greatness. What is true greatness? Many of you, if you are in business or a leadership role or any of those kind of things, or if you're just generally a reader, you may have heard of the book Good to Great by Jim Collins. It is pretty well known in business leadership, and if you uh, have been to any kind of school that teaches on areas of leadership, Jim Collins is a, is a resource that many often go to. And in his book, Good to Great, he talks about how businesses move from being a good, kind of, you know, middle-range good business to becoming a great business. And a key part of that is in its leadership. And he mentions that those businesses which have had humble, servant-type leaders are the ones that most often move from being a good business or company to a great business or company. A more recent leadership commentator and writer, Simon Sinek, also gets on these themes, talking about how great leaders are those who demonstrate humility, empathy for those that they lead and those that they work with, attitude of service. Another uh, popular leader in society today by the name of Will Smith, one time in an interview even said, maybe being great is just being good repetitively. Rep repetitively. And so in all of these examples that I've given you, when we think of the word great, what usually comes to our mind and what comes, I believe, to these different writers and leaders' minds, is a definition of great would be someone who has become successful, someone who has grown or grown something to the point where it is recognized as being um, wonderful, recognized as being influential, recognized as being big or impacting things, making an impact on things, achieving goals, um, and achieving personal success and in a way they are getting at something when they write on these things and talk about greatness but I think when we come to our text today and we look at the conversation of Jesus with people in these passages about what true greatness is he says true greatness is serving not that serving is an avenue or a lane towards true greatness as a strategy to become great, but that serving in and of itself is great. Simply put, not as a, not as a tool or a, a way to manipulate yourself towards greatness, but just to serve. 
is to be great. And so what we're going to see this morning is that Jesus is great. We're not. He served us, so we serve him and others, which is great. All right? That's my simple thesis today. Jesus is great, and we're not. Because he served, we serve, and that's great. So I want to look at this actually in two main categories. The first, looking at Jesus' greatness, and then the second, looking at our lack of greatness, but how we can be, become great by serving others. And so if you have your worship guide, you can actually look on the back of that worship guide, and I've got it broken down into two, those two sections with some verse references. We'll be flipping back and forth a little bit here if you're following along in your journal or in your Bible or on your device, phone, whatever you're using to look at these chapters, Mark 9 and 10. So what we see starting out in chapter 9 is that Jesus is taking his disciples, specifically Peter, James, and John, and he's leading them up a high mountain by themselves. And we've seen this before. There's a pattern in Jesus' ministry in life where when he wants to go away, kind of get away from the world, get away from the distractions of the world, get away from the busyness of ministry, um, he will go off into a mountain, and it says he goes there to pray. So in other words, he's going there to be with his Father. He's going there to, to, to be quiet, to be silent, to listen, to be in communion with his Father, with God. And in this specific setting, he's invited three specific disciples to join him in that. I just think of what a privilege that is for these three. And we actually see that in Jesus' ministry. Jesus actually has a pattern of having different circles of influence. So he's got crowds that follow him. And then he has a group of disciples, which is around 50, that follow him, that he spends a little bit more time with. And then he has the 12 disciples that he spends even more time with. But then in different stories, you actually see that Jesus has three specific men, three specific disciples, Peter, James, and John, that he spends the most intentional and dedicated time with. In other words, you see a pattern of Jesus in ministry having circles of influence to various degrees, really for the sake of developing leaders in ministry. It's leadership development. And so there's actually a book called... The, the Master Plan of Evangelism, which is one of the books we kind of model our discipleship here at Christ Community Church after. And so as many of you know, I, I actually meet with a few specific people, and then I have a broader influence of people that I meet with, and those people meet with, and then we meet as a large group, we meet in home groups, we, there's different ways we go about doing ministry and leadership development here as well. And that's really modeled after Jesus' ministry. Okay. That was a little bit of a side note there. but So here's Jesus. He's with these three disciples on this mountain. And it says this glorious thing happens. He's transfigured before them. In other, way, in other words, he, he changes. Something about him changes. It says that he becomes bright. His clothes are so white that no one can bleach them that white. And there appear with him Elijah and Moses. So what's going on in this passage? What's going on in this? Well, if you remember that Jesus often will summarize his, the, the teaching of the Old Testament as the prophets and, and the law. The law and the prophets. Well, what you have here is you have the leader of those two categories of Scripture being represented. You've got Moses who kind of initiated and led in the law. He wrote the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. And then you've got Elijah, who was known as one of the great prophets, and specifically the prophet who was predicted to come again before the Messiah would come, which later in this passage we realize is John the Baptist. So that's who's there, and the disciples, they're, they're kind of perplexed, they're kind of um, a little bit afraid, it says, and it says they don't, they don't know what to do. And so they actually say, let, let us make three tents, I'm in verse 5, let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Because it says, for they did not know what to say, for they were terrified. So, so this glorious thing is happening. They're kind of in shock. And so they come up with the best solution they can think of. They feel 
almost like, okay, we should probably say something. What should we say? Hey, why don't we make three tents so y'all can hang out here? And a voice from heaven comes down, and it says this, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Listen to him. In other words, hey, calm down. Chill out. Slow down. Be quiet. And just listen to Jesus. Listen to what he says you should do. Don't try to come up with solutions on your own. Don't try to figure out what, what am I supposed to do next? What's the next thing on my task list? What, you know, where, where do we do, what do we do to serve Jesus? What, what can we do in this situation? God says, whoa, slow down. Be still. Be quiet. And just listen. Listen to Jesus. I talked about this a little bit last week, about the busyness of our world, right? How many of us need to hear a voice from God every once in a while that says, hey, be quiet, slow down, and just listen. Just listen for the Lord. Just listen for Jesus. And then follow him. But first, every once in a while, we just need to stop. I actually had the privilege and the uh, opportunity this past week to go on a personal prayer retreat, really trying to follow Jesus' model here of, of getting away into the mountains and praying. So I actually went back, uh, went to Oconee State Park this past week by myself with our camper and just spent a couple of days up there. And it was awesome. And let me just tell you, as a pastor, you need me to do that. Okay? And I know it might seem a little, well, man, what a, you know, that's awesome. He gets to go away and camp for two days on his own as part of his job. Listen, you need me to do that. I need to get away and be with Jesus. I need to get away and, and, and pray and be still. And I need to learn from his word. Because if I'm refreshed and rested, I really think you're going to benefit more from that. Than if I'm overwhelmed and busy with life and ministry and all these things. And listen, you need that. As much as you think you've got to do the next thing and be busy and do this and do that, you need to stop and be with Jesus. You need to get away. You need to listen to God. How do we do that? We get in his word. We read it. We sit still and quiet. And man, how countercultural is that? Everybody's got their phones now, right? I mean, I, I, don't, I don't have TikTok, but I saw some TikTok videos a couple weeks ago, and I was ready to spaz out. I was like, you know, it's just like noise and flashing and all this stuff. And I'm like, my goodness, they're just trying to, to, to spaz us out. And I actually heard recently that teenage girls are starting to show signs of Tourette's because of the repetitious ongoing videos that they're watching all the time. And they're mimicking that in their own behavior. And so let me just stop and say, teenagers, you need to put the phone away every once in a while. Adults, you need to put the phone away every once in a while. Parents, you are responsible for your kids' growth and behavior and what they're being exposed to all the time. All of us need to be quiet and be still and listen for the Lord. Okay? Now we're like seven verses into our passage of two chapters, right? But we all needed to hear that. We all needed to hear that. So Jesus is great. He shows that in many ways. He shows that through his miraculous power. He shows that through uh, helping this person who came on behalf of their son. And this man came on behalf of his son and he pleads before Jesus and he says, help me. And Jesus says, what does he say? He says, if you can, please heal my son. And what's Jesus' response? Jesus' response is, if you can. What do you mean, if you can? Haven't you heard about my ministry? Now, I don't know if he really meant it that way. But he said, anything is possible with faith through God. Anything is possible. If you just believe. And what's this man's response? Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Man, what an awesome and honest confession. What, what this guy is saying is there are degrees to our faith. Yes, if you come to Jesus Christ in saving faith, you are saved and you are secure in him. 
But as one who is saved by grace through faith, we all have degrees of faith. We all struggle from time to time, time to time, with doubt and, and unbelief and degrees of unbelief. There's a great story in Genesis 15 when God and Abram, before he changed his name to Abraham, God and Abram are entering into a covenant together in Genesis 15. And it says, at one point in that passage, God tells him the promise, he gives him the promise, and it says, Abraham believed the Lord, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And then two verses later, Abraham says, Lord, how is this going to be? How is this, how is this going to work out? What do you see in that passage? You see, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. I know who you are. I know you're in control. I know you're great. I know you're all powerful. I know you're sovereign in all of these situations in our life. In the sickness, in all the suffering in Ukraine, I know you're in control. Lord, help my unbelief. Help me to see how you're in control. Help me to rest in your control, to be still, to listen. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. What a great confession from this guy. And so what does Jesus do? He helps him. He heals his son from this possession of this demon. Now, Jesus is great. That's our theme right now at this point. And so where does Jesus' greatness most show up? Well, if you flip over to chapter 10, verse 32 to 34, this is where Jesus' greatness really shows up, I believe. This is where Jesus, again, predicts his suffering and death. It says the heading is that he does it for the third time. This is the third time. So he's there with the people, and it says they were all amazed in verse 32. And then he said to them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. That's a pretty clear presentation of the gospel right there, isn't it? And then we actually find out other places in this passage that the disciples were so confused by this. They're like, wait, what? You remember last week, Peter, right? Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. When Peter tried to contradict Jesus' prediction of his own suffering and death. Why? Again, because the Jews had their own vision of what God's glorious kingdom appearing was going to look like. It was going to be this powerful leader who showed up, who knocked down the Roman authority or whoever the authoritarians were at the time, knocked them out, set up an earthly kingdom, and reigned in power over all their enemies. And Israel, the Jewish people, would once again be the great people of the nation. Now, what's the problem there? Their view of greatness is the world's view of greatness. And Jesus is demonstrating true greatness. How? By serving and suffering and sacrificing on behalf of his people. He predicts the true greatness, which is that he would become a savior for sinners. That he would suffer and die on a bloody cross. That he would be flogged, whipped, his flesh would be ripped open. And that he would die a death that we all deserve, suffer under the wrath of God for sins, for his people. But that he wouldn't stay there. That he would rise after three days. That's the good news of the gospel. That, that's the grace of God for his people, his sinners. And Jesus had to do that for us to be saved. He, come, he couldn't come in in a worldly way and just take over with power. He had to save his people from their sins. Another place in our passage, 1045, Jesus says, The Son of Man came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so true greatness is that Jesus is great, and that he came to serve and save sinners. So what's our response to that? Believe. How do we do that? How do we believe? How do we believe on this Jesus? Well, I gave you one, one practical example earlier. Slow down and stop and just be with Jesus. 
and say, Jesus, I know I get so busy with life because I feel like I have to be in control of all these things. But you're in control. Help me to believe that you're in control. Lord, forgive me for my sinful pride of trying to run all these things on my own. And help me believe that my sins are forgiven, that you love me, that you're with me, and that through faith in you, I'm forgiven. And I can be with you forever. And I'm going to enter into an eternal rest one day where I can be with you and listen to you forever. But help me to enter into that it, during my week, during my work day, whatever that might look like practically. So believe and rest in Christ. Rest in his saving work. Rest in his true greatness. So that so Jesus is great. And then the second thing I want you to see is that we're not great because we're sinners. But as we serve, we are also demonstrating the greatness of Jesus. Now, a couple of things I want to get to here. And I'm, I'm going to be pulling out a lot of random things. So you can try to keep up in your uh, passage there. Um, I'm going to be mostly, as you see, in, in the later half of chapter 9 and all of chapter 10. But Jesus really sets up a theme here. And the theme is that true greatness is to serve. And a lot of people have taken this passage and they have kind of like those writers and authors that I was talking about at the beginning of the sermon. They have said that serving and being humble is the way we become great. The way towards greatness, the way towards success is to be a servant of all. And then the Lord will exalt you. He will reward you or whatever the, the, you know, he will bless you. If you serve in humility, the Lord's going to bless you and make you great. And I don't think that's what this is saying. I really believe that what Jesus is saying is whether or not you see worldly success, worldly position, worldly status, worldly recognition, all of those things, your company grows or not, your, your brand increases or not, your church it, you know, is successful or not, the great thing is just serving. That's what's great news. To, to serve anonymously. To serve in a way that you know you're not going to get anything in return. So to serve simply for the sake of serving is what is great. Serving is not a gimmick. It's not a strategy towards success. Serving is not a way for us to get to a point to reach goals or anything of those things. Now, why do I say that? Well, if those are your intentions in serving, if your attitude, I'm going to serve people, because if I serve people, the Lord's going to bless me. He's going to bless my business. He's going to bless whatever I'm, you know, whatever my endeavors are, and I'm going to become successful. That's not serving. That's self-serving. Right? And so don't you get this a lot in churches and in Christian books and all these things? You're being pounded with this all the time where we take this phrase and this teaching of Jesus and we say, if you really want to become great and successful, serve others. But the truth is, serving others is what's great. Whether or not you get recognized for it or not. Whether or not you get exalted or not, serve for the sake of serving. End of story. Now, what's our example? Jesus. Jesus came to serve, he says in 1045, and to give his life as a ransom for many. He didn't come to serve to get anything in return. Now, yes, Philippians 2 says he was exalted to the highest place and given the name above every name, that in the name of Jesus everyone should kneel and bow and tongues confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But he didn't get that because he came to serve. That was already his status and position. He was equal with God already. He had every right to our worship and glory and honor and to be called Lord of all. He was already the Lord. He came to serve because of his love for us, not because of what he would get in return. Do you believe that? Do you believe Jesus came to serve in utter humility and utter sacrifice, not to get anything in return? Why? Because we can't bring anything to the table. 
The only thing, and this is one quote I've heard, I don't know who to give credit to this for because it gets thrown around all the time. But the only thing we contribute to our salvation is the sin that makes it necessary. That's the only thing we bring to the table, our need. And so Jesus meets us in our need. He's our example. And so if you know Jesus' love, if you know his sacrifice for you, if you know how he has come to serve you, that's what will enable you to serve others without expecting anything in return, whether it's from them or from God as some form of reward. You serve simply for the sake of serving, and that's what's great. And Jesus gives us four examples, or Mark gives us four examples from Jesus' ministry. He talks about the children, he talks about the rich young man, he talks about James and John, and he talks about blind Bartimaeus. Now, I wish I had time to actually preach a sermon on each of these, but like I said, uh, we're trying to get through the book of Mark in one semester. I'm trying not to hang out here all, all year long. But in these four examples that we get, we get a couple things. It's really a demonstration of the humility and the service that Jesus is talking about. When he talks about the children, he says, become like a child in your faith. Well, what does that mean? That means we're acknowledging our dependence. We're acknowledging our need and our neediness, and we're saying, Lord, I can't do anything apart from you. I can't serve others sacrificially without wanting anything in return unless you change my heart and enable me to do that. Because my heart wants to be recognized. My heart wants people to say, wow, what a great man. What a great servant leader. But if I serve for the sake of serving, I'm not going to desire any of those things. So like a child, and when you come to Jesus and say, Jesus, I need your help. I need your help to serve people the way you've called me to serve. You get the rich young man. What's the rich young man's problem? Well, he loves money more than people. Very simple. He loves money more than people. Jesus challenges him right at the heart. He said, the rich young man comes, what must I do to be saved? And you saw in there, first of all, good teacher. She says, why do you call me good? Don't you know no one's good but the Father above? And so there, there's Jesus. He's interacting with this rich young man. And he says, you want to you be good? You want to be able to enter the kingdom of heaven? Obey the law. Obey all the commandments. And the, the nerve of this guy. Oh, Jesus, I've done that. What else can I do? And so what does Jesus do? Well, he attacks where his heart truly is, which is the love of money and, and, and possessions. But what he's also doing is, if you remember, what's the first commandment? The first commandment is um, to, to worship the Lord alone, right? To worship God, him alone, alone have no other gods before me, and what does Jesus do? He attacks this man's God. He's saying, you think you kept all the commandments? Let me just start with the first one. Sell all your possessions and give it to the poor. Oh, Jesus, I can't do that. What's Jesus' point? You're not keeping the commandments. You failed at the first one already. He could have gone through all ten to show this guy where his heart truly was. But he didn't. Why? Because the guy walks away realizing he had much wealth and he wasn't willing to give it up. And so, are you willing to let Jesus come in to wherever your God is, whatever your idol is that you put in the place of Jesus, and for him to say, are you willing to give that up for me? To serve me? To serve others? Maybe it is money. And maybe you say, well, Kent, he was talking to somebody specifically. He's not really talking about me, about giving my money away. Well, if that's your attitude, maybe you do love money a little too much. Is generosity one way that describes you? Jesus seems to say in other parts of his teaching that generosity is a main descriptor of a Christian. One of the main ways you can pick out a Christian from the rest of the world is how they give to others willingly, sacrificially, generously. And so it's, it's something for us to think about. Listen, that's, that's a struggle of mine. That's an honest struggle of mine. I, I would say from... From middle school on, the love of money is one of the sinful vices that I've had to repent over and over and over and to become a more generous person. And the Lord has worked in me by His grace, but I've got a lot of growing still to do. 
But he can do that in me and he can do that in you. Then you get the story of James and John. James and John come and with boldness, they also say, Lord, we want you to give us whatever we ask. <laughs> wow. They said it out loud, right? But actually, if we're honest with ourselves, a lot of times we come in prayer with that same attitude. Lord, I want you to give me whatever I ask. And what do they ask for? They ask for glory with Jesus. And Jesus says, are you able to drink the cup that I'm going to drink? And what, again, what's in their mind? Their mind is a royal throne, wine flowing. Oh yeah, Lord, we can handle our drinks. And Jesus said, you don't know what cup I'm talking about. I'm talking about a cup of suffering. And you will drink from that cup. You will suffer like I've suffered, like I will suffer. And, and, and they do. James was actually executed by sword. John suffered to the point of being put on the island of Patmos. At one point in, in church history, it says he was boiled alive. Didn't die, but he was boiled alive. So they did suffer. They did drink from the cup. And they learned what it meant to serve a, a God who had come to serve them sacrificially. So there's James and John, and then you get blind Bartimaeus. Again, a desperate, helpless man. What is his prayer? Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. And sometimes that's all we can say, right? Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. Help me to serve. Forgive me of my sins. Show mercy and enable me to do what you've called me to do. So we serve not to become great, but because serving is great. So I just want to give a couple of practical applications of that. To try to wrap up. The first is a test. All right. Here's a servant test. I didn't come up with this. This actually was a, a pastor by the name of Jack Miller who was preaching one time on the uh, on this idea of serving, and he said this. He said, "Here's a test about you know you can evaluate how much of a servant's heart you have. Do something good this week for somebody. Now don't overdo it. You know don't push yourself too hard, but do something good this week for somebody. Something simple." and easy and then he said you know let it be something kind or generous something to help someone but do it anonymously in a way that you know that person is not going to be able to repay you or do anything for you in return and then don't tell anybody about it not even your wife and don't even have an expectation that someday down the road, when I'm old or tired, whatever, I'm going to be able to tell people about this. But do something this week for somebody anonymously and don't let anybody know about it. And if that's a difficult concept, then you're starting to get an idea of how much of a servant's heart you have. Are you willing to do that? I'll, I'll be honest, that's kind of tough. <laughs> I want a little bit of credit for what I do, for, for the serving. But that's what Jesus is saying. We serve just for the sake of serving. And then the last thing um, is remember, continually remind yourself and remember why Jesus came. He came to serve. He came to die for your sins. He came as a sacrifice for sinners. That's why he came. By remembering this and preaching that to yourself, that's how you're going to grow, and that's how you're going to be able to serve others, the more you're reminding of him serving you. In chapter 9, verses 30 to 32, it says that the disciples were actually afraid to ask what Jesus meant when he predicted his suffering and death. So they didn't say anything. And listen, let me just say, never be afraid to ask more about Jesus, more about the gospel, to, to have a desire and a curiosity to continue to learn and grow and be challenged. Never be afraid to ask because this is the most important thing that you can understand in your life. The gospel, the, the truth of God's word. So if you're young, a child, and you feel like this stuff's above your head, maybe you're in middle school, high school, you feel like, oh, this is stuff for the adults. Don't be afraid to ask what all this means. Jesus wants you to understand this stuff too. 
If you're a young adult and maybe you feel new to the faith or maybe you feel like, oh, people probably know the answer to this. This is something I'm supposed to know. This is a dumb question. I'm not going to ask this. Never be afraid to ask and grow more in your faith and understanding of the gospel. And then if you've been in church a long time and you're realizing, you know, I really haven't learned as much as I probably should. I don't know as much as I should. I haven't given the time to understand these things like I wish I should. And now I'm just going to look like a fool for not knowing these things. Never be afraid to ask and dive in and learn more about Jesus. Don't be ashamed of that. That's a good curiosity to have, to want to know more about all this stuff. So never be afraid to ask. Continue to learn. Continue to see Jesus' love and service for you. And in response to that love and service, serve others, because that's great. Let's pray. Father God, we praise you and thank you for your love through your Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus, thank you. You are great and greatly to be praised. You deserve all glory and honor and power. You are the Lord of the universe. And so help us to recognize you for all the greatness that you possess. Help us to remember and apply the gospel to our hearts to continue to listen to you and listen for you, to listen to your word, to have a, a gospel curiosity, to continue to grow, to continue to want more, to continue to follow and learn from you, and to walk in humility and repentance and faith when we don't do that. And help us to serve willingly, sacrificially, without expecting anything in return. That will only be by a change of heart, by your miraculous power, the power and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue in worship, uh, we're going to give now in worship. Give back to the Lord what he has first given to you. And you can do that now in the offering plate. And I also want to, I don't know if any of you know this, but we actually have a, an online option for giving where you can actually sign up and it'll just automatically withdraw. So if you're a techie type person and that's how you want to give, you can do that online on our website. It's from ChristCommunityBL.com slash give. You can do it that way. And then just to remember during this time, we're still worshiping as you give in that way. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I
wisdom, and to have a servant's heart. We thank you for those who gave, those who wanted to give but did not have the means to do so. And we just thank you for your grace and mercy. All these things we pray in your name. Amen. So 
please do stick around for another five to ten minutes uh, if you are able uh, specifically church family um, regular attenders and members please stick around for that now receive the benediction may the love of God the Father the grace of the Lord Jesus and the presence the power and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever amen let's now sing the blessing of Oh, they bless you.